Jesus, just before he leaves the earth, 10 days before Pentecost, 40 days after his resurrection, Christ had showed himself alive for 40 days. In verse 8, gives his final words. This is Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where it says, But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. Uh, if you're marking your Bible, maybe you might want to mark where it says here, witnesses unto me. In Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and under the uttermost parts of the earth. You know, when people think about power, uh, they sometimes think about something else than what the scripture, I believe, is saying. Sometimes we think about Superman, that he's more powerful than a speaking, a speeding locomotive or uh, faster than a speeding bullet or able to leap over buildings with a single bound uh, or whatever. But that's not what it's talking about here. It's talking about here the power to be a witness for Christ. Notice, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit is come upon you and you shall be witnesses. God's purpose for this age is that we, the church, the body of Christ, comprised of all believers since Pentecost, tell the rapture who trust Jesus Christ as their only means of salvation, that we should become his witnesses. God really wants us to tell the message of Christ to someone else. It can begin with our family. It can begin with our children. It can begin with our brothers and sisters. It can begin with our parents. It can begin with our neighbors. It can, you know, begin where we are and then move out. And here we notice it was to begin in Jerusalem. That's where the, the disciples were gathered together. And then it was to move out to the next area, Judea, and then further out to Samaria, and finally to the uttermost parts of the earth. As we look through the early pages of the book of Acts, it seemed like the Christians didn't want to go out. They wanted to stay right where they were. And so if that had been the case, the church at Jerusalem would have become a big, giant super church. And everybody would have stayed right there and said, boy, this is great. We've got Peter. We've got James and John. And we've got all these apostles. And wow, wow. Here we are, and we're right downtown Jerusalem, and uh, nobody would have ever wanted to go anywhere. But God's plan was that the word would go out, and it would go out through individuals just like you and me. And we find that as you move through the book of Acts, we see a lot of this, but I want you to jump to chapter 8 for just a moment, where we see here the stoning of Stephen, the first Christian martyr, and we find that Saul was present and gave consent. Saul became Paul, you might remember. And in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, it says, Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. Notice, persecution was the order of the day. Christians were being, were being persecuted and uh, here we see in the previous chapter, Stephen being stoned to death. Saul there, verse 1 of chapter 8, consenting uh, to his death. And look at what happens at, in verse 1 of chapter 8 here. It says, And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of what? Mark it down. Judea. Remember, that was the first area they were to expand out to. The gospel is to go from Jerusalem out to Judea. And then where was it to go? Look at verse 1 of chapter 8 of Acts. And Samaria. That was the next area outward. And then it says here, uh, uh, except the apostles. The apostles didn't leave, but the believers were being scattered. Uh, they were being, uh, you might say, kind of kicked out of the nest. And it says in verse 4 of Acts chapter 8, Therefore, they were scattered abroad, and what happened? And they went everywhere doing what? Preaching the word. You know, God wants each of us to be carrying the word outward from our Jerusalem, and that might mean from where you are right now, and we're to expand outward with the message uh, to our family, to our friends, to our relatives, and, and it can go out and out and out in ever-widening circles. A lot of you probably have relatives in other cities, in other states. So if you begin just to work on your relatives, 
uh, you'd probably see the gospel go out across the country. How can you win them in other states? Well, you can go see them or you can send them a tape or you can converse with them over the telephone. You know, you can lead people to Christ over the telephone. Have you ever thought of that idea? That's a novel idea, isn't it? But it works. You can actually do that. And uh, maybe we don't take advantage of that uh, often. But I know I've had people tell me, and I don't want you to do this now, but uh, they have a relative in such and such a city, and, and if I give you my calling card, would you call them and witness to them and, and share the gospel with them? Well, I know that everybody will run up here with their <clears throat> uh, phone numbers of relatives and probably say, you do it for me. But really, God wants to use you. But I have done that before, and I have talked to a relative, and I've introduced myself and said, look, you know, you have a family member that's really concerned for you, and they asked me to call you and to take a few minutes and just explain to you what means so much to them, and that is the gospel of Christ, and to go over the plan of salvation with them and have them come to know Christ right over the telephone. I remember one lady in particular that wanted to get married, and the guy she was dating was not saved and she wanted to follow scripture and that she would marry a saved person. The person that she was interested in marrying was Jewish. And this lady was in Ohio and the guy she wanted to marry was in Miami. And she said, would you talk to him about Christ? Well, I called him on the telephone in Miami and I told him how important this was to the girl that he wanted to also marry. And how that uh, she wasn't going to marry him unless he trusted Christ. And I wanted to explain what that was all about. And went over the gospel with him. Well, you know, he trusted Christ as his Savior. They got married and, and you know, they've had Bible studies in their homes. Uh, in particular, to reach Jewish people for Christ. And many things have happened over the years. But, you know, it's interesting that you can actually lead someone to Christ over the telephone. But God wants all of us, I think, to recognize that beginning from day one, even before Pentecost began, 10 days earlier, Christ, just before he ascends up into heaven, says when the Holy Spirit comes, he'll give you power to be able to open your mouth so you can witness for Christ. And maybe you've never witnessed to anyone in your whole life. But basically, it's just a matter of learning how to present the simple plan of salvation uh, in an understandable way to somebody who's lost. And then if it makes sense to them to ask them if they would simply trust Christ as their only hope and means of reaching heaven. And it's something that really all of us can learn how to do. If you didn't know how to do it, you can learn how to do that and uh, to share the message. And I would recommend that you think about how you came to know Christ as your Savior and maybe think about how you might tell that story as a means by which you can share the gospel with a friend that you'd like to reach. Because the most effective tool that you and I have is our own testimony. And that is to tell the story that, that we experienced. And I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about that here today because I think it uh, requires of you to give a little bit of thought. Now, when you talk about a testimony, you're not talking about a bragamony. It's not talking about how wonderful you are and how great you are and now, you know, that uh, you're in church, that uh, you're a different person and, and wouldn't they like to become wonderful like you? Uh, that is not a testimony and that's not what we're talking about. I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're going to take a look at a verse that is often used to perhaps uh, uh, create people who give bragamonies. But uh, this is a verse that is misunderstood, mistaught, and does not mean what many people would lead you to believe that it means. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. I'm sure if you've been around Christian circles, you've heard this verse quoted. It's a popular verse. It's quoted often. And 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, this is page 1233, if you have a Bible loaned out, page 1233, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It says here, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. It should read creation. 
Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Generally, the way this verse is used and interpreted, people will say, you know, before I was a Christian, I used to do, and they list all the terrible things they used to do. And then they said, now I'm a new creation. And I don't do this anymore, and I don't do that anymore, and I don't uh, do that, and this, and that, and the other, and these are all the wonderful things that I do, and I'm so wonderful, I know you just want to be just like me. Well, obviously, that is not what this verse is saying. Uh, the verse is saying that when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you become born again, you become a new creation. And not that you won't have any of the old habits still around in your life, which maybe you ought to get rid of. But it's saying that the old conditions that existed prior to your salvation have now been removed and now brand new conditions exist for you. In other words, and we've got a sheet back here, born again, what happened, where I've listed 39 things uh, along the line that we're talking about. You see, prior to being saved, you were lost. Now, according to the Bible, you are saved or delivered from going to hell. Before you were saved, you were headed for hell. Now that you're saved, you're going to heaven. According to the Bible, before you were saved, you were a child of Satan or uh, of this world. And now that you have trusted Christ, you've been born again, and now you're a child of God. Uh, and so on and so on. And there's lots of these things that are all brand new that happen at the moment you trust Christ as your Savior. And so we are really not really wanting to talk about ourselves so much in a testimony, but a testimony is to give witness to what Jesus Christ did for us and who he is. Let's look a little further down here because it actually tells us, well, let's look at verse 18. All things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. The way we were reconciled to God, we were enemies of God, separated from God, but now we have been reconciled to God, it says here, by Jesus Christ. And, hath, and God hath given to us the ministry of reconciling others to Christ. And then it says in verse 19 how this is done. It says to wit, that's old English, we don't use that phrase too much anymore, but to wit means that is to say, or here is what you're to say. So when you are reconciling others to Christ, here is what you are to say. And there are three important things in verse 19 that it tells us we're to say. Number one, we're to say that God was in Christ. Amazingly, a lot of people don't know this, and I didn't even know it the night, until the night that I got saved that Jesus Christ is actually God himself who came to this earth and took on human flesh. I'd kind of heard in my church that he was a great religious leader, a great teacher, but I never had ever heard that he was actually God. But according to the Bible, Jesus Christ is God. And that's essential because if he were just a man, then he really couldn't save you and me. Uh, he needed to be a man, yes, a sinless man, in order to pay for the sins of another, but he had to be God in order to pay for the sins of the whole human race to make an infinite payment. He goes on to say here, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And that phrase you might slip right over, but what it's saying here is the opposite of what religion teaches. Religion teaches that we reconcile ourselves to God and that's based upon our good works, our good behavior, and all the wonderful things that we're going to do. And God says that we can't reconcile ourselves to God because our best works are filthy rags in God's sight and we can't get ourselves connected back up with God by anything that we would do. You can be religious and still wind up in hell according to the Bible. But the opposite of religion is what the Bible teaches and that is that God, through Christ, does the reconciling. We can't reconcile ourselves, but God left heaven in the person of Christ, came to the earth and died on the cross of Calvary to pay for your sin, debt, and mine in full so that he can reconcile us. In other words, our salvation is based upon what he has done, not upon what we do. So when we accept Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross, that he paid our sin debt in full by his death, that by trusting that he did that for us, we're reconciled to God based upon what Christ did for us. So he's the one who does the reconciling. If we could have 
reconciled ourselves, then Jesus Christ could have stayed in heaven. He never needed to die. He actually died in vain. And the Bible teaches that. If we could have earned our way to heaven, then Christ died in vain. But Christ came because we could not earn our way to heaven or reconcile ourselves. The third point here is the most amazing of, uh, of all, and it's almost shocking to Christians. It was shocking to me the first time I read it. In fact, it was almost so different than what I've heard all my life. I said, can it really be true? Can it really be true? It says in verse 19, the third thing, not imputing their trespasses unto them. What it's saying here is that God is not charging all your sins against you. That almost sounds impossible, doesn't it? Whoa. We usually hear preachers saying, well, you're going to go to hell because you did this or be because you did that. Or, boy, if you don't start doing these things, uh, you're definitely not going to go to heaven. And notice the Bible says here that he's not charging our trespasses against us. What it's telling us here is that every sin that you and I would ever commit in our entire lifetime was taken by Jesus Christ and paid for on the cross. So that there is only one sin that you're held accountable for. Only one sin that could cause you to go to hell. And that's the sin of unbelief. Every other sin that you would ever commit in your whole lifetime has already been paid for by Jesus Christ. He paid for your past sins, your present sins, and your future sins. They're all paid for. As far as going to heaven is concerned, they are paid for. And he does not charge those against you. There's one sin that we're held accountable for, and that's the sin of unbelief. If we believe, God saves us. Hold your finger right here. Look at John's Gospel for just a moment. And in John's Gospel... It tells us in chapter 16 about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is God. And God, the Holy Spirit, is involved in us getting saved. God, the Holy Spirit. This is page 1138, if you happen to have a Schofield Bible. Page 1138, John chapter 16. God, the Holy Spirit is involved in convicting or convincing everyone in the world of their need of Christ and of the means by which we're saved. Let's look, if you will, at verse 8. When Jesus tells us this, it's prior to Pentecost. He's talking about when the Holy Spirit has come. Here's what the Holy Spirit will do in relationship to the lost and to evangelism. It says in verse 8, When he has come... He will reprove the world of what? Of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. If you look at the next verse, it says of sin because they what? Believe not on me. In other words, the sin that the Holy Spirit convicts a person of is the sin of unbelief. Because it is that sin that will prevent a person from going to heaven. Isn't that amazing? You never hear anybody preach on that. You never hear anybody say that hardly. But that's the sin. The Holy Spirit convicts you of the sin of unbelief. It says of sin because they believe not on me. And it is that sin of rejection of Christ that is the sin that can cause you to be lost for all eternity. If you die without Christ, you will definitely not enter heaven. Verse 10 says of righteousness, which is what God requires for entrance into heaven. We must be as righteous as God is. And yet we are not. But that righteousness, the righteousness of Christ, the righteousness of God, is credited to the account of the believer as Jesus took our sin, and then he trades and gives us his righteousness, which is credited to our account. Lastly, in verse 11 of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged, and we're also going to stand before God and be judged. And if you die without Christ, then you're going to stand before the judgment and ultimately be cast into the eternal lake of fire. So let's go back here to chapter uh, 5 of Second Corinthians, page 1233, where it tells us what to say. Verse 19 says, to wit, 2 Corinthians 5, 19, to wit, that is to say that God was in Christ. That's number one. We recognize that Jesus Christ is God who took on flesh. Number two, that he's the one who does the reconciling based upon his finished work, not based upon our works or our deeds. Thirdly, he's not charging our sins against us there's one sin that can cause us to be lost, the sin of unbelief. 
He goes on to say then in verse 19, and God hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. That's the word of God. We have this book, and when we take the message from this book to a lost person, and they believe that message concerning Christ, then God saves them. And in verse 20, he says, right now we are ambassadors for Christ. Maybe you never recognized or knew that you were an ambassador, but every believer is an ambassador for Christ. When did that happen? Well, every believer is an ambassador. And the Holy Spirit gives us power to open our mouths and be witnesses as we represent Christ and our, his ambassadors to tell others about what he's done. And it says in verse 21, and with this verse, he makes the plan of salvation ultra plain, that God made Christ, for he hath made him to be sin for us, that is, God made Christ to be sin for us, Christ who knew no sin, that is, that Christ was sinless, he was perfect, that he never ever committed a single act of sin. Christ was without sin. And the last phrase of the verse says that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We must be righteous to go to heaven. And when we trust that Jesus died for us, his righteousness is credited to our account. This verse tells us how it took place at the cross, that God took our sins, laid them on Christ. Christ was made to be sin for us. This is the sinless son of God. Christ was without sin. And yet he was made to be sin. The last phrase tells us so that we might be made his righteousness. So when you trust Christ, God says you become saved. You become uh, a recipient of the gift of eternal life. Our most powerful presentation is to tell our story to someone else. And the Bible talks about telling our story. As you read through the book of Acts, Paul recites his story of how he got saved on numerous occasions. And what's so powerful about that is it's personal, it's your story, and people are probably going to listen to you to tell your story if it's not too long. And in other words, if you came up to somebody and said, look, I would like to preach to you for an hour, what's going to happen? They're going to look at their watch and say, no way, I don't have time to listen to you preach to me for an hour. In fact, I don't want to hear you preach at all, and uh, not even for five minutes. But if you were to tell them, I'd like to tell you what happened to me. I'd like to tell you how I came to know for sure that uh, I would go to heaven if I were to die. They'll oftentimes sit back and they'll listen to you tell your story. Now, your story ought not to be a bragamony where you tell how wonderful you are. You have to Begin by saying we're all sinners, including you, including me. And that uh, you then want to really incorporate the scriptural story in your testimony. Because you're not really going to be telling about you. You're going to be telling about Christ and what he did for you. And maybe how you discovered uh, that wonderful truth. So as you think about giving your testimony, the core part ought to be about what Jesus did for you. And to make that clear. And then the peripheral part would be about maybe how you came to learn about that story, about how to be saved. And everybody has a different story. But yet everybody who's saved, in a sense, has the same story because there's only one way to be saved. So if you're saved, you're saved the same way I'm saved. And if I'm saved, I'm saved the same way you're saved. There's nobody who's been saved any differently. Everybody is saved by faith alone and Christ alone. Nobody is saved any differently. But your story is unique. My story is unique. How I came to find this out is different than how you came to find it out. And so everybody has a, a unique story to tell. And that story is powerful. And it's the most powerful approach that you have to talk to somebody who's lost. And when I tell my story, I go back to, and you've heard me tell it in this church. I use it all the time, even here that I was just graduated from high school. My sister, in my words, became a religious fanatic. She went to a Bible study in addition to church on a weeknight and thought it was fun. And I said, you know, she's flipped out. She's crazy. She, something's happened to her, poor thing. And she pestered me to go to that Bible study. And finally, to get her off my back, I accepted 
Well, that's really how I came to hear it. Because when I got there, it wasn't as I thought. Uh, everybody there looked normal. And yeah, they were, it seems, having a good time. And they opened the Bible. It was a Bible study. And for the first time in my life, I heard the essential points about how to be saved. I learned that we're all sinners. And I can tell as much or as little about what actually I experienced as I learned the story. But I remember that night, and I like to share it sometimes, is that there was about 50 or 75 teenagers all sitting on the floor in a living room of a lovely home in Miami Shores, Florida. And uh, the man who conducted the Bible study said, how many of you have never told a lie in your whole lifetime? Raise your hand. Well, I knew I couldn't raise my hand because I'd told two or three at that time. That's not true. <laughs> but I knew I couldn't raise my hand, but I looked around that room and, and, and it was a shock to me because I thought, boy, hands are going to go up everywhere. This is the, this is the good crowd. You know, this is the Bible carrying kids and they don't do anything wrong and, and surely everybody's going to have their hand up but me. And no hands went up and I was shocked. But you know, the Bible had taught all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. I, I, I learned a Bible truth. I knew I was a sinner, but I didn't realize everybody else was. But I found out that night that everybody is. Inside your bulletin, we print it usually every Sunday. There's a sheet here. It says, qualities of an effective personal worker. If you go down to the middle of the page, it talks about steps of leading a soul to Christ. The first point there is establish the fact that what? A on Roman numeral two, or there's no Roman numeral two on here, is there? Uh, but under the second division there, steps in leading a soul to Christ, right in the middle, it says, A, establish the fact that all men are sinners. Well, that was easily established that night for me. How many have never told a lie? Raise your hand. Nobody could raise their hand. Everybody admitted that they were a liar <clears throat> in the story. Everybody's a, uh, a sinner in that room. I was a part of that. Then I learned... Point B, that the penalty for that sin would be death. And that means in the Bible, separation from God in hell. If you cross-reference that with Revelation 20, <clears throat> verse 14, it says they were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Revelation 20, 14 tells us that death, the payment for sin, the wages of sin is death, which is ultimately being cast into the eternal lake of fire. Well, that's kind of scary. So if you have ever sinned, which we all here have, the penalty for that sin, according to point B, is that we'll go to hell. Uh, Revelation 20, 14, you ought to write that down. They were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Thirdly, I was uh, informed that night that one lie would be enough to keep me out of heaven. Turn, if you will, to it. It's listed on your sheet here. But look, if you will, at Revelation 21, 27. Revelation 21, 27. Here it says on page 1352, it's the last book of your Bible. It ought to be easy to find. Revelation 21, 27 says on page 1352, there shall in no wise enter into it, that is in, into heaven or the New Jerusalem where the believers will one day go to be with the Lord. It says in Revelation 21, 27, there shall in no wise enter into it anything that what? defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a what? A lie. A lie. One lie. But they which are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'll never forget hearing that for the first time and recognizing that I was in deep trouble. If one lie would send me to hell, I was in trouble. And I really began in my mind to say, there's got to be an answer. There's got to be a solution. How then can you go to heaven if, if you couldn't even have told one lie, that one lie would be enough to send you to hell? Well, then I learned from the Bible that salvation had nothing to do with my works, but rather was dependent on the finished work of Christ. Look, if you will, at Ephesians 2. This is a great verse, and we should never become tired of turning to it. You may have turned to it many times before, but I'll tell you, I'll, I'll uh, venture to say I've turned to it more times than you have. I love this verse and I use it whenever I witness because it's one of the great verses. Almost every time I try to lead someone to Christ, 
I, I like to go to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. I was talking to my dad. It was about two years ago now. A friend of his that he worked with uh, before he retired years ago was dying in, in a nursing home. Called up my dad and said, I know that I only have a few months left to go and I'm dying and give me some verses so I can read them and find out how to be saved. And uh, apparently he couldn't write anything down. He was in bed in the nursing home and there were staff around and my dad says, read John 3.16. And my dad said that he could hear him holler out to the people in the, the staff, I guess, that worked at the nursing home, write down John 3.16. Apparently, they wrote it down. And he said, what else? He said, well, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. And he could hear the guy say, write down Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. And apparently, they, they wrote that down. Well, you don't want to overload somebody who's unsaved. A couple of verses are, are probably better than a thousand that they won't see or understand. But he left him with those, just a couple of verses. And when they conversed again, apparently, it was quite clear to this man and uh, he trusted Christ. But it was wonderful that he called my dad to find out information. He knew my dad was a believer. And, and as he neared death, he realized, well, I know somebody who could tell me some verses to look up. And he called my dad long distance from New York down to Miami. And my dad just gave him those two verses. He said, if you believe that, you'll be saved. Well, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, a couple of the great verses in the Bible. It says in Page 1251 in Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace, grace meaning mercy, unmerited favor. It says, by grace, by mercy, are you saved? How? Through faith. The next phrase says, the salvation is not of yourselves. It also says, at the last phrase, it is the gift of God. Verse 9 says it's what? Not of works, uh, lest any man should boast or, or brag. In other words, it's not based upon what you do. If it were, you could boast or brag about it. You could say, look how wonderful I am and I'm going to go to heaven because I've done all these wonderful things. No, God says it's not based on your works, but it is the gift of God. If you had to do something to earn it or to gain it, it wouldn't be a gift, would it? A gift is something offered free. And that's the great news about eternal life, that it's offered as a gift to all that would simply trust Christ as Savior. Point E on the sheet here says, show how that God provides a sin bearer and imputes or charges to or credits to man's uh, to man his righteousness. And that's the verse we just looked at. The one that's listed here is 2 Corinthians 5, 21, that God made Christ to be sin for us, Christ who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And then verse uh, under point F, there's only one condition. There it's in John three sixteen. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever... There's one thing that's required of you to be saved. Whosoever believeth, that word means to trust. If you would believe or trust in Christ as your Savior, you would not perish, but you would have everlasting life. It's really that simple. So what I would do, if I were learning how to give a testimony to somebody else, I would get some of the guts of what you need to say down, which is right here in these seven points that are right here in your bulletin. Learn those well. And then you could just tell your story. You know, for me, I was raised in church, but I never heard how to be saved until I was out of high school. Thanks to my sister, I went to a Bible study where I learned I was a sinner. That if I paid for that sin, it would be by separation from God in hell. That my works couldn't ever gain for me salvation. But uh, if I would trust Christ, that he would credit my account with righteousness and the only condition was that I would believe or trust on him as my savior and as you tell the story about what Christ did for you and how you came to learn about it and a person's listening to that that they will obviously uh, as they listen if they understand this they'd be a fool to turn it down and I think you'll have a great success rate in telling somebody about Christ and uh, wherever you go you've got your testimony how you came to know Christ. And I think the focus, though, has to be on what Christ did for you. One last verse, and with this I'm going to probably quit, but this look, if you will, over in Thessalonians, page 1271. This is Second Thessalonians. Paul, the apostle, 
tells here about the return of Christ and how we as believers will one day be gathered together unto Christ and live with him forever. Page 1271, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. It says in verse 10, when he shall come, that's when Christ will come. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints. The saints are the believers. If you're a believer, you're a saint, whether you realize it or not. And it says here, and to be admired in all them that believe. Notice, saints are believers, and Christ will be admired by all that believe, as all believers will be gathered together to be with Christ one day in heaven. And the last phrase of verse 10 is what I wanted you to see, where it says, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Paul, read the book of Acts, told his testimony, how he was headed out to kill Christians and throw them in jail. On the road to Damascus, God interrupted his journey and smote him with blindness. Later, he gets to the city of Damascus. There, he's in a house praying for salvation. God, at the same time, speaks to a man named Ananias and says, Ananias, there's a guy over there on a street called Straight in the house of one uh, uh, over there that, uh, I forget his name, but he, he wants to know how to be saved. And Ananias runs over there, tells him how to be saved, and Saul gets saved and becomes Paul. But he told that story a bunch of times about how, wow, I was headed on a wrong direction. God interrupted my life. And sometimes maybe that is what brought you to Christ because sometimes events in our lives are usually a triggering point to when somebody gets saved. Usually somebody gets saved when some significant event happens in their life. Maybe graduating from high school, maybe graduating from college, maybe getting married, maybe being in a car crash, maybe having some serious illness, maybe having a surgery. If you think about when you got saved, maybe you got saved right after one of those significant events in your life. When you're pausing to think about life and eternity and, and what's going on, that's a time when God can speak to you and you can hear this wonderful message. And Paul is saying, that he told his story. And because many believed his testimony, which was about what Jesus did, that he trusted Christ when he learned the plan of salvation himself. And then he told that story to many. He says, when we get to heaven one day, there'll be all these believers who believed. And they're there because it says here, our testimony was believed in that day because back then he preached it. And there may be loved ones and friends that will be in heaven because of you, because they believed when you told them your story about how you trusted Christ as your Savior. Think about it. And I think we'll talk a little bit more about this because uh, Satan, I'm sure, doesn't want you to know this because this is the most powerful tool you have to tell wherever you go. You don't need a track. You don't need a Bible. You just need to tell your story and incorporate in it the biblical story about what Christ did how you came to learn about it, how you then believed it yourself and became saved. And now that you've believed it, you know you're going to heaven because you have God's promise and his word that all that believe on Christ are saved forever. Let me illustrate with this and we're going to have lunch and we hope you'll join us for that. I'm going to let this hand represent everybody here. I'm going to let my hymnal represent sin. God says, I love you. I hate your sin. I want you to enter my heaven but no sin can exist in the presence of God. How can we get rid of our sin? Well, you and I cannot get rid of our sin by anything that we would do. We'll wind up in hell, even if we try hard, do our best, go to church, get water baptized, confirmed, you name it. You can do all those things and go to hell. We need a Savior, my other hand, representing Christ. He is that Savior. Jesus took our sins off of us upon himself on the cross he paid for them in full, was buried and rose again from the dead. When you trust that he did that for you, God saves you and you become his forever and ever and ever and ever. It's that simple. And as a believer, if you've done that, you can be effective in leading someone else to Christ by just simply telling your story. That's the great story you can tell. You can say, hey, let me just tell you what happened to me. And most people are going to listen. And you'll be able to share 
the story, how it unfolded, how you came to understand the gospel, how you came to trust Christ, and now how you know you're saved because you believe what God said is in, the, in the Bible is true. And that's how you know you're saved. Let's bow in prayer and we're going to be dismissed. With heads bowed, with eyes closed, with no one looking around. Friend, if you came here today and you were not sure about whether you would go to heaven or not, Chances are, maybe you've never really understood until today the plan of salvation. But in any case, right now you can settle it. Between you and God, you can right now trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your only hope of heaven, and God up in heaven will forgive you, and you'll become a child of God, and you have God's promise that whosoever believeth in Christ is not going to perish, but they're going to have everlasting life. How do you do it? Well, pray a prayer like this. Just say, God, I admit that I'm a sinner and, and we all are sinners. We might as well admit it. But God, right here this morning, what I heard made sense. I believe Jesus Christ died for me on the cross, that he paid for my sins on the cross when he died for me. And he was buried. I believe he rose from the dead. And I trust him right now as my savior. Would you do that? It's that simple. I trust Jesus Christ right now as my only hope of heaven, as my Savior, as the one to forgive my sins, to give me the gift of eternal life. And in your own words, if you just would simply trust Christ as your only means of reaching heaven, God would save you. Now, you don't ever have to look for a feeling to know that God responds to you. Some people look for that feeling, and we're never told in the Bible to look for a feeling. We're told to simply believe what God has said. God's not going to lie to you. He's not going to trick you. Believe him. You saw it in the Bible. Just take him at his word. How again, just God, I admit that I'm a sinner, but I believe Jesus Christ died for me. I believe he paid for my sins, was buried and rose again from the dead. I want to trust him right now as my savior. It's my only hope of heaven. Friend, the moment you do that, God saves you. If you did it, I'd love to pray for you. We're going to close the service and a word of prayer will be dismissed in just a moment. We'll sing and then we'll go. But while no one is looking, on purpose, so you'll not be embarrassed. I'm going to be looking, but nobody else is. And while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, no one will know but me if you would raise your hand. And I'm going to ask in a moment for a raise of hands of any that would say to me, I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior right here this morning in this service. I pray that prayer like you talked about. And I'm going to let you know by lifting up my hand and putting it down. I'll be the only one looking, so no one else will know. No one's going to have you down the aisle. No one will trick you or come running up to you or embarrass you, but I would like to be able to pray for you. Would you let me know right now if you prayed that prayer this morning to trust Christ? Would you slip up your hand? God bless you, yes. God bless you, yes. Any others? I trusted Jesus Christ right here this morning. You can put your hand down. Anyone else? I trusted Jesus Christ right here this morning as my Savior. I prayed that prayer. Would you pray for me? Slip up your hand and put it down. Is there any others? Are there any others who would say, I did that also? Pray for me. I trusted Christ as my Savior this morning. Pray for me. Christian, what about you? Are you a witness? God, the Holy Spirit, wants to use you as a witness. He wants to empower you to be able to open your mouth. And today we talked about the simple way we could just tell our story and use Scripture and tell about what Jesus did in a simple way. And we can have people coming to know Christ as Savior, as we witness to what happened to ourselves, as we give testimony as to how we were saved. Lord, uh, use us, each of us. As we approach Vacation Bible School, we pray that many would be raised up as workers to tell little boys and girls that what a great practice place to be able to share the gospel in a wonderful environment where kids are asking questions and wanting to know. And many here could get in on the joy of of leading someone to Christ, maybe for the first time in their life. We ask you to bless our dinner that will follow here in just a moment and the services tonight at 6 as we study the book of Revelation. We ask you to bless our church and give us a great summer. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing a chorus that uh, we did a few weeks ago. Soon and very soon we're going to meet the king. So let's sing it and then let's go next door and have lunch. Soon and very soon we are going to meet the king. Soon and very soon we are going.